Welcome, one and all, to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. This is, as usual, Ben Man Returns. And also returning is... Andrew Man <laughs> Returns. <laughs> Indeed. We both return for this. And we're return returning to Returns, week. too. Yeah, since Pretty much we every also... <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, so, this last time we talked about the comic adaptation, this week we're going over the novelization, which we haven't uh, talked about before. Uh, we've talked about the Batman 89 novelization, we've talked about Batman Forever novelization. Guess we're going out of order, but it is Christmas time, and I uh, figured it was about time for us to go over this. Also, I have the notes since, like, last year, so I'm like, at some point well. we're going to cover this. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think I, I think I read this when I was a kid, man. I don't remember this one. anything oh, wow. about it because I was, God, eight when this came out. But I do, I do think I read this actually many moons ago. You read it before I did, because uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I, I got guess. this, I got this a couple years ago, using. Well, technically, you got this for me because I, I, I remember I returned. You got me something that I had, but I returned it so I could buy this. Uh, right. Okay. So, which now, then now we're talking about it. So, because nice. uh, I was thinking back in terms of like, how did I get this? I'm like, oh yeah, that's how me. I got <laughs> Roundabout. So, thank you. Yeah, uh, no problem. So, going into, uh, we're going to go in, as usual into the differences from the movie. Uh, there's going to be some crossover with what we talked about in the comic adaptation, but uh, there's some other added details that are in the novelization, like there always seems to be whenever we go over novelization stuff so it's always fun to sort of see how the uh, different authors add more to what we saw on screen right so uh i guess we can go into it let's pop this up starting with the birth of the penguin so uh novelization specifies that penguin was born in the 1950s so if batman returns is set in 1992 then he's born in 1959 since it specified that penguin is 33 in the movie so God, he's thirty three in that movie. He does, yeah, he's definitely not. <laughs> Devito, wow. this, Devito was not thirty three. They just they did it because of the whole twisted Jesus thing, I guess. Millennials uh, are aging better than everyone. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> so it's just the sewer down there. I guess. I guess so. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot of aspects from the shooting script by uh, our former guest Daniel Waters, one of our favorite interviews. And Wesley Strick, who we haven't had on, but it'd be hilarious if we were able to get him on with Waters at the same time, and then Waters can just rip into him on the stuff. But I'm sure that they've, uh, I'm sure that they've made up since then. Uh, but uh, <laughs> they had been, yeah. Uh, in the opening sequence uh, with the baby penguin, uh, there's the music. Santa Claus is coming to town. Uh, with uh, basically, they make the lyrics. Uh, out of context, feel very creepy. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. And that's playing in the background. Uh, and that is set up for later on when uh, Penguin is looking at Gotham City in present day, 1992, and saying, I know when you're sleeping. I know when you're awake uh, in the novel. So uh, kind of a nice little callback there, even though none of that's actually in the movie. And it's also indicate, indicated that Penguin is narrating the prologue in the novel, which is cool. That's cool. Uh, that's not something I was expecting. Uh, the novel carries over the ideas from the original scripts where there's a Batman store, which we've covered before. Uh, yeah. This is technically in the movie. You see the wreath, but you don't see the Batman symbol on it. And at the same time, there's a Batman sled for sale, uh, which we've seen in concept art. And it's described that a father gets it for his son, but like hides it behind his back. And uh, again, in the movie, there is a sled, but it does not have the Batman symbol on it. It's just a regular sled. So that's kind of too too meta. They decided it was too meta. Did you, did I you ever, guess so. You ever figure out the official reason they nixed all this? Did you ever get any word on that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember. I don't think Daniel Waters knew when we talked to him about it. Or maybe he did. <laughs> they just gave me a check. <laughs> maybe we need to go back and rewatch our own. And episode. I keep on getting them. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know in the comments if we covered that. <laughs> We don't remember so, everything we've said so, ever. So definitely it would have been Daniel Waters telling us, but yeah, I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I don't remember. For once, I don't remember one of the tidbits, probably because it didn't come from me this time. You might have uh, listened to the episode recently, and then you know more than we do Yeah, uh, what so, we said. Because we have... <laughs> let us we know. Don't, if we I don't usually go back and listen to older episodes. I listen to the 
episodes as they release. Mm-hmm. So it feels like I'm listening with other people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's about it generally uh, for me. I should, I should go back to re-listen to the Waters one, just also because it's, I think it's one of our best interviews in general too. Yeah. And I'm sure there's other stuff that I forgot that he said on there. So yeah, it's true. I'll check it out. Uh, but we do go into Alfred a little bit in his shopping spree. As we see here, it says that he's been doing the Christmas shopping for the Waynes for the past 40 years. Uh, obviously meaning both the parents and then later on Bruce when Bruce was an orphan. Uh, and so it says that he's getting the Christmas goose, new ornaments for the tree, and small presents on Bruce's behalf. Though here it kind of just looks like he's carrying the groceries. But that's what's specified in the novel. <laughs> yeah, it's one big-ass red package i don't know <laughs> uh i don't think the maybe the goose could fit in there i don't know <laughs> yeah, uh, he's got the goose in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah the actual one uh alfred is later described as finding out that he has a parking ticket on the rolls royce i guess he should have uh parked in a better spot or didn't read all the signs though if it's anything like la he probably just misinterpreted the you know 60 signs that were on that street that tell oh, you God. all the different rules of when you can't park there. If you guys don't know this out there, look up LA street parking signs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, but like there's a few areas in LA where it's like, you got to have a PhD to figure this fucking shit out. Yeah. You got to do a fucking math problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Equations. You thought you'd never use a uh, calculus in the real world, dude. You can you use it when parking. you're trying to park in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just like, ah, fuck it. I'm just going to find a parking parking garage I'll pay. Yeah, definitely. It's r- fucking ridiculous in some of these areas. Yeah. So I guess Alfred was a victim to that. Though you would think if he was Christmas shopping for the past 40 years, he would know. Uh, though I, I think I'd have to go back and, and find the specifics, but I think the main reason why he gets it is because of the whole lighting of the, you know, the Christmas tree ceremony that's happening with, with Shrek and the mayor. Right, so, yeah. If he didn't uh, procrastinate on his Christmas shopping, maybe he wouldn't have gotten a ticket, Alfred. But that's neither here nor there. So he going has too in, much to do. <laughs> I especially guess so. with Bruce gone all the time now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's more small character details given. It says that Max's son Chip is a star quarterback. No, you know, no surprise there. And it also specifies the mayor's name. The mayor's just called the na- mayor in the movie. In the novelization, he's called Mayor Jenkins. The uh, Batman fan wiki also goes as far as to call him Mayor Roscoe Jenkins. I have no idea where Roscoe comes from. But I, I tried to look. <laughs> I tried to look for Roscoe in the in the book. I'm like, I I think somebody just made that up. He's a chicken <laughs> and a waffle tycoon. Don't you know, know that? That's how he became the mayor. Everyone loved <laughs> yeah. his chicken, and they gave him the mayor. God uh, damn it! You got my vote. It's also why I mean, it's it's similar to how. With Lieutenant Eckhart in Batman 89, let us let us, let us know where the name of Lieutenant Eckhart's first name comes from, because he's obviously L- Lieutenant Eckhart in 89, but according to a lot of fan sources, his name is Lieutenant Max Eckhart. And I'm like, wh- where's the Max from? He's never called Max in the movie. He's right. not Max in any of the scripts. I don't think he's Max in the novelization. I think somebody just randomly added that to the wiki, uh, uncreatively too, I think, because we've already got Max Shrek in the next movie. We could have found some other name, but whatever. <laughs> Right. Um, Selena also is described as having post-its around her computer that say, don't get jokes, uh, or that she doesn't get jokes and, quote-unquote, save it for your diary. So basically, like, very self-critical notes to herself. And these will change when she becomes Catwoman. So it's kind Mm. of setting up how, um, I guess, how much she loathes herself uh, in her current form and uh, how things are going to change when she becomes Catwoman. Okay. Uh, and then, just like in the comic adaptation we covered, there is a small extra bit where Chip Trek tells Selena that it's not the caffeine that gets them going, it's her obedience, uh, which they cut because they didn't need it. Uh, right, right. There's another character beat that I think is better that isn't necessarily needed, but there's a part where Max Shrek hands two bills to you know Salvation Army Santa that's outside the store ringing the bell. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the cameras, on t- the top bill is a 50 and you would assume that the other is a 50. But when Santa removes the top 50, the bottom bill is a single, you know, George Washington dollar bill, <laughs> just to kind of show the two sides of Max Shrek there. Uh, okay. So I think that's a nice little character moment, but I can see that they just didn't have time uh, for that in the movie and why it was cut. Uh, he also thinks he sees someone with an umbrella down below in the sewer. 
through the sewer grate. So he's already okay. kind of catching on. The penguin's watching him. During this, Gordon is revealed to already be there as part of the job, waiting in his squad car. And then he witnesses when the giant gift comes in and thinks, just like everyone else, that it's Max Shrek's publicity stunt and thinks he's going to use that as an excuse to fine or write Max Shrek up for breaking some kind of law. So clearly Gordon is not much of a Max Shrek fan uh, in the novelization, which kind of adds a little bit more depth to him considering he has like a two-minute role in the entire movie. Craig Shaw Gardner, by the way, is the, is the author to this novelization. I realize I didn't say that <laughs> at the top. It's the same guy who wrote the novelization for oh. Batman 89. <laughs> uh, so there were some sections or chapters in the 89 novelization that were from Gordon's perspective. So that's what he's kind of carrying over in the Batman Returns novelization. Uh, what else has he novel- written, do you know, offhand? Well, he wrote that Batman Murders book that we discussed as being kind of uh, like another another novel that's in the same vein that also has the 89 symbol on Batman's chest, but I still haven't gotten the chance to get my you know, copy on eBay to check that out yet. Did he Maybe write any be... non-Batman related stuff or it's all Batman? Uh, you know, I'm sure he has. Uh, I think he got it because of the fact Some... that he was working at a comic shop at one point, but I'm not really familiar with his work outside of Batman. I'm looking to see if there's anything here... No, not my copy. Because sometimes they have like the about the author thing. It's like, you know, Craig Shaw Gardner, check out his yeah. science fiction series of the robots of whatever. But it's not, there's nothing yeah, in yeah, about yeah. that, sadly. Fabio love so. stories or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> check out his erotic <laughs> romance novels. <laughs> and Wait, okay, books he's got you. a book in 86 called Malady of Magics. The Other mm-hmm. Sinbad, okay. Night the in the Sinbad. Nether Hells, mm-hmm. A Multitude of Monsters. It's like fantasy stuff, a lot of fantasy stuff. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, he's got a he's got a Battlestar Galactica book in 2006. Oh, nice. Um, so, yeah, I guess so. Best known for producing fantasy parodies similar to those of Terry Pratchett. He's a member of the Swordsman and Sorcerer's Guild of America, a loose-knit group of heroic fantasy authors founded in the 1960s. Okay. Well, there you go. There's our author info. All right. Well, now we know in terms of his background and stuff. So yeah. that's cool. Uh, I'm sure if he's out there, we can bring him on and we can talk about more about the novelization stuff. But I should also check out the uh, Batman murders before that. Oh, yeah, for sure. So... Um, the novel also states that Bruce remembers another winter night from many years ago where his parents took him downtown for shopping, dinner, and then a show until they were killed. Now, this is presuming that his parents were killed during Christmas time, and that could explain why he's also kind of got the holiday blues during uh, the events of Batman Returns. But this also is contradictory to the 89 novel that Craig Shaw Gardner also wrote that said that it was summer. Whoops. Okay. So, I don't know, but uh, either way. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I don't think... Um, plus, the, again, this is before people were really sticklers for continuity, I think, when it came to their, uh, That's their right. movies. So uh, it does make it seem like this is the anniversary of his parents' murder again, uh, which, again, is why he's so broody in the mansion and waiting for the signal to, to pop up, like we see in this image. <laughs> so, Right. Uh, I kind of like that idea overall of it being around that time and and it's sort of reminding him of that there's another bit later on that i'll i'll talk about where he's reminded of his parents because you know the the aspect of the wayne murders was a big part of 89 but is not mentioned at all in 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 batman returns it doesn't have to be mentioned but it is kind of cool to have um, some sort of element added into the uh, the novelization my grandfather died in december Mm. Uh, when my dad was like 12 or 13 and my dad has said many times he doesn't really like Christmas because of that memory. Oh, wow. So I was reminded of that. So yeah, I, I mean, that. you know, you just don't get over stuff like that kind of mm-hmm. ever. So, and of course with, <laughs> with Batman, right? Like, you know, yeah, all, I think all that's connected what we just talked about. Like, man, I can see how that would be tough during that time of year, you know, to, to always be sort of reminded of that, especially when everyone else is supposed to be, like, so happy and it's a time to, like, be around your family. So to, to yeah. lose a family member at that time kind of makes you feel the opposite of what most people would. 
Yeah, and I think many people are are similar in that way that had mm-hmm. bad memories of that happened in December. So, yeah, and Bruce Wayne is no different. Nope, definitely not. <laughs> I think he might be uh, even more on the extreme side of that. <laughs> right. So, uh, let's see. With the sequence where the Red Triangle Circus Gang attacks, uh, there are hints that Selena does work out a lot, and that enables her to dodge out of the way from the motorcyclists in the beginning. Uh, so they're kind of, I guess, setting up the fact that Selena is physically able to do all the stuff that she's eventually going to be able to do as Catwoman, rather than it seeming that she's magically able to do that without any sort of training. Uh, so which I, I kind of like the idea that it's sort of a latent part of her that gets reawakened when she becomes Catwoman. Uh, so it does, this does get contradicted a little later though, when she thinks she'd be lucky to run to the subway, uh, and doesn't get to run much. So I don't really, I guess it's kind of contradictory or maybe she just doesn't do a lot of running a lot in her workouts or it doesn't think that she's doesn't have much faith in herself. I don't know, but that's kind of just what's in here. Uh, Novelization also indicates that Alfred's Rolls Royce is both bulletproof and shatterproof. I guess something that Bruce updated to it to protect themselves there. Uh, So when this attack is happening from the Red Triangle Circus, Alfred is there and he helps save a girl from the strongman during the riot. Uh, To help Alfred out, Batman shoots a disc out from the Batmobile. Alfred ducks and it hits the strongman. So that's kind of a cool little moment uh, where that gives Alfred, I mean, Alfred Goff, Michael Goff's Alfred, a lot more to do in the sequence, but uh, maybe they just didn't have time to shoot that. Maybe they, he didn't, he wasn't available to shoot anything else other than just carrying the Christmas goose in the red bag. I don't know, but right. it's not in the uh, in the final film. There was a uh, previous comment as well from one of our fans about how, uh, due to this, it kind of hints at personal reasons why Batman straps the bomb to the strong man later on in the movie where like maybe it was because of the fact that he was threatening Alfred. So, Oh, that's a nice save. Yeah. That's a nice theory. Although I mean, it, still doesn't, it doesn't change the fact he blows the guy up. Yeah. If it's like, you know, <laughs> morally better comic Batman than well, in a lot of the other comics, he still wouldn't kill him. He would just make sure his ass goes to jail. Right. Probably just punch him really hard. Just make sure to break his nose, but still like take him to the hospital or leave him alive enough to go to the hospital. So uh, that's that's kind of a little bit of a backstory between Batman versus the Strong Man before uh, he straps the bomb to him. Uh, we also get sort of what we got in the comic book adaptation where uh, there's a little bit more added dialogue of Selina complaining to the clown played by Branscombe, one of our former uh, guests as well, who played that terrifying clown, uh, that uh, he broke one of her heels and uh, him complaining that out of all the people he picked for a hostage, he picked her, which is which was kind of a nice little moment. I don't know why that was cut. He didn't even seem to know that was the dialogue before I showed that to him in our episode, so it definitely wasn't something that was shot, unless he forgot about it, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> which is also possible since it was 30 years ago. As we know. Uh, so other character beats from the script that make it into the novel. Uh, Selena has pictures all over her apartment of her like on a trampoline as a kid, her on her 15th birthday with a horse, her climbing a mountain when she's in college. So it's sort of like her glory days type of thing or a better childhood that she had. Presumably, those are sort of the pictures you see on the walls, but we don't get enough of a shot of anything on there for us to really know that that's what that is, in the movie at least. Uh, so uh, there's also the there's the whole sequence where she's listening to her answering machine and uh, there's this whole thing there about a rape prevention class telling her that she needs to go back and, and continue her classes, which I think is just Wesley Strick's way of, of uh, explaining how she's able to fight later on in the movie. Right. So um, I think, at least I think that was Strick. Again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, <laughs> Waters is going to scream at me if I gave it to the wrong, <laughs> gave it to the wrong guy. So it could have been Waters. Uh, moving on to the next step. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing, uh, interesting detail is uh, when Max Shrek is kidnapped by Penguin and Penguin pulls out the stocking that has all the dirt on him. Max Shrek seems to recognize the stocking as one that his grandmother used to knit for him. Now, I guess it could be seen as Pe- Penguin actually having achieved or gotten uh, Max's childhood stocking but uh, or stocking from childhood, but uh, there is... 
a possibility that this is Craig Shaw Gartner referencing the older draft where Shrek and Penguin used to be brothers or were brothers in the uh, Daniel Waters script. So it uh, could be a little bit of that DNA is, is transferred over there. Who knows? But thought it was a nice little detail. Uh, we get some other details, too, on the Cobblepot family when uh, Oswald discovers that's where he's from. It says in the novel that the, the Cobblepot died, quote-unquote, young and mysteriously. Not many details are given on that. Some have taken that to mean or imply that Oswald actually did know who his parents were and went back and killed them. But uh, we don't know that for sure. I think that might just be... That's just a fan theory, really. There's not a lot of evidence for that in the movie, I feel. Um, Oswald also says that his father was a district attorney mm-hmm. at Gotham, which is kind of interesting. Penguin's father being a DA in Gotham. And uh, his mother was active in DAR, which is Daughters of the American Revolution. So a little bit of a backstory on the Cobblepot huh. there that we didn't huh. get. Uh, let's see, both this and the shooting script. Uh, so Batman is patrolling the streets. Uh, basically, he is uh, talking to Alfred in the Batmobile and Alfred telling him, like, why are you still awake? There was supposed to be a scene in the movie that's in the novelization where it's revealed that Bruce was actually recording the, um, the conversation that he had with Alfred and tells Alfred that he learned to live without, without a mother a long time ago. Uh, so this kind of serves a couple purposes. One is that it shows, it sort of plants Batman being able to record his conversations in the Batmobile, which he then uses against Penguin. And uh, it also is a little bit more of a dynamic between Bruce and Alfred, with him sort of getting on Alfred's case for trying to be uh, like, like his mom, which is sort of... Uh, reminded me when reading this of of Pattinson telling Andy Serkis that he's not his father. Like, there's a little bit of that DNA in there, too. Uh, let's see. In the novelization as well, the, the order of scenes is a little different. So uh, in this, in the shooting script, the scene in the Batcave where Bruce is looking into the background of the Red Triangle Circus, that actually happens after he's been spying on Penguin from the Batmobile, as opposed to right beforehand. And then, like we've talked about before, there's a whole different order where Selena does not get pushed out the window until well after Penguin forgives his parents, which then enables the timeline to be that uh, that is the night before Bruce's meeting with Max. So they did a lot of shifting around of the timeline here uh, when it came to the final movie. Okay. Uh, and just like in the comic book adaptation, Chip Shrek is a witness to Max Shrek uh, pushing Selena out the window and agrees to cover for him. And the next morning we have this deleted scene with Max looking out the window and discovering that Selena's body was not there with Bruce with him. And that's where this image of Christopher Walken looking outside this broken window comes from. This is a image that goes around a lot, especially when people talk about Max Shrek, but not a lot of people note that this is not in the movie. This is actually from this deleted scene. So uh, it's also explained in the narration that uh, the power plant that Max is using, uh, like how that necessarily works, because in the book or in the movie, it's talking about how it's like hoarding power, storing it, uh, which when you really think about it, that kind of doesn't really make any sense why that would be do that why you'd be doing that. And there in the book, it says that uh, it's uh, the idea is free electric power that would help him undercut competitors, especially uh, foreign investments. So I still don't quite get that myself, but it feels like a more <laughs> more like plausible or it feels more plausible just because there's a lot more words there. I think Craig Shaw Gardner was just trying to explain something when it came to uh, that plant. Just looks, these stripes remind me of Beetlejuice, and this was very close oh, yeah. to Burton's Beetlejuice. He just loves these, he loves stripes like this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> it, it definitely has that Burton feel yes. you know, to the costume. 100%. Makes sense, too, since uh, Tom Duffield, the, the art director we had on our show, was also on Beetlejuice. So I can oh, kind yeah, of see that's true. the crossover. Yep. He wasn't the costume designer for this, but. You know, like you, you sort of see some crossover in just the look of everything. I do wonder if he's part of Beetlejuice too. I don't know. I haven't looked in, into that yet. Uh, going <laughs> further, let's see. Bruce in does meet Selena as usual. Um, <laughs> laughing at Chip's expression in the background. <laughs> his, his, his expression is just like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he... He meets Selena, she walks him over to the elevator, and then he realizes that he only knows her first name as Selena, but doesn't know her last name, so he can look up her phone number. So he goes out of the elevator, 
track her down and ask for her, basically either ask for her last name or her phone number, only to catch her uh, making Max Strex coffee and trying to uh, <laughs> squeeze blood out of her finger to pour blood into it, mm. which is really fucking weird. That's weird. Uh, I think that's I think that's Waters. That just feels like Waters to me. Um, <laughs> but again, I have to take a look again. Uh, and she's joking that she's pouring herself into her work. And I guess Michelle Pfeiffer is so hot to Michael Keaton in this moment that he doesn't seem to even notice the world's greatest detective that she's doing this, and it doesn't turn him off anyway. Um, this did, really didn't well, turn out to be necessary. Anyway. He never calls her. Yeah, it's his weakness. <laughs> He never calls her in the rest of the story, so I can see why they didn't think it was important for him to know her last name to call her, because he just runs into her on the street later on. He never really needs her phone number in this, so Mm -hmm. uh, it's just whatever. Uh, Let's see. There's also a deleted scene of Max calling Penguin to set stuff up, but Penguin says he's too busy because he wants to continue with his list, the list that he's making, of course, of all the firstborn children of Gotham. Uh, And then... Selena debuts, makes her debut as Catwoman, like we talked about in the comic adaptation, and when we told this to Henry Kinji, who played the uh, who played the guy she attacked, uh, she actually jumps on him with her legs wrapped around his neck in order to stop him, rather than just showing up at the alley, which uh, again would have been a lot more uh, <laughs> probably a lot more interesting for Henry in that moment. But uh, that's, they decided not to go with that. Uh, let's see. It also says that Penguin, well before the whole mayor stuff, plans to eventually double-cross Max Shrek and have the, the Red Triangle Circus gang, quote-unquote, practice on him, whatever that means, um, but most likely kill him in some way. Uh, it's also explained that his hideout used to be an old drugstore. Uh, I don't know what the top level of that drugstore was supposed to be, but uh, it's just kind of Craig Shaw Gardner's explanation for this. Uh, it also says Penguin cites that, uh, oh yeah, in, in the in the novelization, we do get the whole, could be worse, my nose could be gushing blood moment where he bites that guy's nose. In the, uh, in the novelization, he cites the penguins who raised him as the ones who taught him to bite other people's <laughs> noses. <laughs> That's awesome, so, actually. That's one of the most memorable detail. parts of the whole movie. And then after Penguin bites this guy's nose, it says that he actually faints rather than is taken away, which I could probably see why, considering what just happened to him. Uh, so that's a little bit of a change in the novelization. And then in both this and the shooting script, it says that Max provides secret plumbing ducts so that the Red Triangle Circus can't be traced to Penguin's campaign headquarters, which is a nice little detail, I think. Uh, going further, we got a little bit more of the crime spree that's happening in uh, the the Red Triangle Circus. So the organ grinder shows up and he blows up an ATM machine, which is a deleted scene uh, from that. They were It was in the trading cards. Uh, and he gets a whole bunch of money and has the line, quote, all this dough, it's burning a hole in my pocket. Get it? <laughs> burning. Uh, so in the comic adaptation as well as the novelization, novelization, we get a whole summary of an ice rink that got torched and then offensive graffiti and some sort of pharmacy heist. So uh, they, they kind of go into a little bit more details of what the gang is doing. Uh, Catwoman, just like in the comic adaptation and the script, is influenced by this crime, crime wave to go out and uh, brings, out, brings up that uh, she's going to join this quote-unquote orgy of sex and violence. Uh, she also basically plans to ca- basically take advantage of the chaos to cover up her own crime of sabotage, sabotaging Shrek's store. So going further... Uh, she does blow up the store, and it says that her outfit already get, gets messed up from the explosion with little tears in places. So already her costume's getting a little fucked up, uh, just a lot earlier than before, where in the movie, right, it's mainly done because Batman threw the, uh, the napalm stuff onto her arm. Uh, also in this and the script, Selena replaces the post-its on her uh, office desk on her computer. Beforehand, it said all this disparaging stuff to her. Now it says stuff like defy authority, take no prisoners, expose the horror. Uh, it also has her kill a fly in midair, Miyagi style, I guess, and then uh, puts a live cockroach in Max's coffee, uh, which he then spits out, which is just, again, this is, it feels like this was too weird even for Tim Burton to put into the movie, which is why it was cut. Um yeah. And uh, he's on the phone with Penguin because he's enraged that his store got blown up, which 
uh, is a nice little detail because in the movie we didn't actually get Max Shrek's reaction to his store getting blown up. He just, I guess he just didn't really, he has so many in Gotham, he just didn't think about it uh, in the final <laughs> film. But that's just kind of how it comes across. And then uh, lastly, before we get into the break, uh, we get a little bit of an explanation of how exactly the Red Triangle Circus got the blueprints to the Batmobile in order to take it over. So here it says that Max bought the diagrams from the car's designer or a quote-unquote disgruntled former employee of that designer. So kind of left ambiguous. Again, this is pre-Morgan Freeman, Lucius Fox, where it's... You know, it's from Wayne Enterprises, and even then it could still be coming from Wayne Enterprises, but uh, just somebody in that department, I don't know. But those are the details we're given, in the novelization at least, to sort of explain right. how they have this. So that's pretty much what we got uh, for the first half of the novelization. We will continue this after the break. All right, we have our announcements. This is for both December and January. I thought we would just carry that over since we only have one episode in December that this was going to go to. Uh, So we might as well give some extra time for what we're promoting. But uh, we have our own uh, new stuff to to promote. So for those who met me over at LA Comic Con uh, or listened to the Geekscape episode that I was on, I'm promoting Alter Ego, which is an independent comic that I've been working on for a bit. Uh, you can check out the preview. The first five pages are up on my website. That is benwanrider.com slash alter dash ego dash preview. It is essentially a world ruled over by five families of supervillains. The main character is a supposedly a henchman who works for them, but in reality, he's working undercover to bring everyone down. And when he does that, is he going to step in and save the city or is he going to take over the throne and become a supervillain himself? You don't know. Even he doesn't know yet. So it's kind of playing around with who's a villain and who's a hero. Uh, So that's Alter Ego. You can check it out at the preview. And um, you can check out the link that's provided in the description. Uh, Also, for Nuvers Creative for Christmas, we have uh, Batman White Christmas. This is an adaptation, an audio adaptation that I wrote uh, based off of the Batman Holiday Special comic uh, that was written by Paul Dini that had Batman versus Mr. Freeze. It is the one story in that comic that was not adapted uh, into the animated series episode Holiday Nights. So we decided we would adapt it over at Newverse Creative as the uh, Christmas special for them. So check that out over at Newverse. And then over to Andrew. Oh, man, we got a date, guys, for Gaming Guidance. So it's uh, January 9th. We'll start out our... Nine, no, 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 ten, ten episodes, <laughs> see, ten episode season, uh, season two, gaming guidance done in seasons, and uh, it's my video game podcast along with Mike Torres, uh, the co-host of that one, and it's mainly retro gaming, but also the the uh you know Japanese to English translation. There's less of that in this season, actually. We do talk about it a little bit, but um. You know, we we in the first season we did interview a lot of Japanese to English translators for video in the video gaming world. So check out the first season if you're inter- interested in that. Uh, but this one's still, of course, about gaming, uh, yeah. and you'll see. And we have some great interviews. Uh, some people um, are pretty well known actually in the gaming world, which is which is uh, great. Uh, more on that later. But uh, it'll be coming out on Tuesdays for ten Tuesdays in a row, uh, starting January. 9th so stay tuned for that gaiden spelled g-a-i-d-e-n like nin- nice. P- i grew up saying ninja gaiden too before i learned japanese but it is gaiden the, mm. uh, the ninja gaiden is a famous uh famous video game so our, n- our name is sort of connected with all of that so uh anyway sweet and then Metal Force, so metal, www.metalforce.ninja. It's essentially R-rated Power Rangers meet Stranger Things. We are going to do another crowdfunding campaign on Seed and Spark. That is coming soon. I don't have an exact date for that yet, but should be soon as of this episode's release. We did a Kickstarter. We got some funding there, and we want to try one more before we go out and shoot again so please check that out uh we are definitely still working on it and uh it's gonna happen it's just it takes a while but yeah um if you like you know bloody horror 
if you'd like Bloody Horror Power Rangers mi mixed with Stranger Things and X-Files and things like that, aliens and stuff, then uh, check it out. Nice. All right. And then for our charity for both <clears throat> December and January, which ties into our upcoming January episodes or current January episodes, depending on what you're listening to right now. Um, ours, uh, our charity that we're promoting, not ours, but the charity we're promoting is the GoFundMe for stuntman Carl Charfalio, who was the first actor to don the costume of The Thing, the prosthetics, I should say, for The Thing, for the 1994 Fantastic Four movie produced by Roger Corman that was unreleased, but uh, kind of took on a life of its own years later. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, the on the according to the GoFundMe, his uh, his years of uh, <clears throat> it says pounding the ground as a stuntman caught up with our beloved stunt brother. He has experienced a cumulative traumatic spine injury that has robbed him of his ability to move on his own. So, unfortunately, he's in need of a lot of help, especially in physical therapy. And uh, I figured, especially considering that we're going to be talking a lot about that Fantastic Four movie, uh, the least we could do is help promote his GoFundMe to help uh, other people bring in more funds to help Carl out. So uh, that's over at GoFundMe.com slash F slash Stuntman uh, <clears throat> hyphen Carl hyphen Charfalio hyphen Medical hyphen Fundraiser. Uh, and uh, hopefully you can help out with uh, him and the family for that. Yeah, it's crazy what these stunt guys, stunt men and women go through, everybody. So um, as you can see, some pay a higher price than others. And uh, yeah, if you could help out, that'd be great. Link in description as Ben has said already. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, with that, that is the announcements. So thank you. I'm tired of Earth. These people, I'm tired of being caught in the tangle of their lives. I'm... And we are back to talk about the rest of the Batman Returns novelization. We are going to go into the second half of the movie, starting with the uh, the abduction of the Ice Princess, as well as the murder of the Ice Princess, really. Uh, so when, uh, when Gordon shows up at the crime scene when I, the Ice Princess is basically tossed off the roof or thrown off the roof due to the bats, uh, he figures it's more likely that Batman tried to save the Ice Princess than to kill her. Again, little character insights, thanks to uh, Craig Shaw Gardner here. Uh, Batman, of course, is shot and lands down below where Catwoman finds him, and that's where we have the whole exchange about mistletoe can be deadly when you eat it. Uh, and in this, uh, Catwoman actually holds the mistletoe up herself rather than uh, Batman noticing the mistletoe hanging up above them. So that's a little small uh, change there. And then, like we talked about last time, in the script and in the comic adaptation and in this, Batman actually crashes the glider rather than having the smooth landing in the movie. Uh, whereas in the Batman 2022, it was the opposite with Pattinson. So uh, mm. again, this a lot of this comes from Sam Hamm's original Batman 2 script that uh, Daniel Waters carried over. So technically, he was the originator of that idea of uh, Batman just kind of you know, eating shit as he uh, goes, uh, as he's trying to glide for one of the first times on film. Uh, so later on, Penguin does try to propose to Catwoman, uh, and that's when she tells him that she wouldn't touch him to scratch him. A little character detail is added here, too, by Craig Shaw Gardner saying that the ring he uses to propose to her has been kept in the sewers for a while, which I guess <laughs> makes sense, <laughs> but probably doesn't make that ring very appealing. It's uh, got my stench on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't want it? So. Smell it in remembrance <laughs> of me. <laughs> Pull the finger. All right, so... <laughs> Penguin takes uh, over the Batmobile in this sequence. Uh, there's a little, there's a few added stuff here too uh, that wasn't in the movie. The Batmobile does shoot a bat disc over at a reporter who's reporting about it, and it hits the guy in the head. It's when he's one of those of new stuff. compact discs that they're uh, all raving about. <laughs> I think it's more. It's think of it more like a um, like a discus sort of thing. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. Uh, there's also a line where Penguin says in the car when he's taking it over that uh, framing Batman, quote, makes his nose hairs, nose hairs tingle. Uh, I actually think this was meant to be in the recording that's revealed later on because, you know, he uses this recording to disrupt Penguin's speech to expose Penguin. But if they kept this line in there and had him say it, then it would have just made it clear that he framed Batman because there's kind of that criticism of the movie 
that uh, it's not really clear how Batman cleared his name for the bat signal to be uh, you know, shining <laughs> at the end. Though, That's again, true. to be fair, he did save all those children from the Red Triangle Circus, but I, I get how that doesn't necessarily negate the previous crime. That's true. So, Does uh, he say the poontang line in, this, in the book? It, he does say it in the book. He does not say it. Shockingly, he does not say it in the comic book adaptation meant for children. Oh, well, <laughs> why? So. Dude, just, they can, children can handle it. Yes, they can handle it. In, He's in, already in biting off. <laughs> we, we can have him bite of a fucking nose, but if he says the word poontang, <laughs> my God. I didn't cover this in the comic adaptation. He does not actually bite the nose in the comic adaptation, I don't think. Let me see. Oh, he doesn't? Oh, okay. He does not, it's, so that's... Oh, so yeah. they steer clear of all that. Okay. His nose gets the guy is in it, but his nose is is uh, you know basically this is the only version where that guy's nose is never bitten. Uh, but yeah, here let me see. Yeah, <laughs> Max Shrek says, "Imagine as mayor, you'll have the ear of the media, women." Dot dot dot, and that's it. It doesn't say unlimited poontang. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most outrageous line in a, in any Batman film ever. <laughs> Yes. That fucking Puntain line. It's if so we get ridiculous. Wesley Strick on, we can compliment him because that's where I remember this from the Waters interview. That's when he was just like, people come up to him. He said that people come up to him and, and are just like, oh man, unlimited Puntain, high five. And he's just like, it was Strick. It wasn't me <laughs> who wrote that. Uh, yeah. That so. whole scene, even outside of the Puntain thing, it's just like, it ends with them saying, I'm cold blooded. It's like, for me, dude, it was like one of the most memorable scenes out of the whole fucking movie. For some reason, I remember it more before we even covered it in the like, you know, mm-hmm. with Zach and every and everything. Before I yeah. rewatched it, I forgot most of shit about the ducks, uh, fucking all kinds of major shit. But I remembered that fucking scene mm-hmm. for some reason. It's just for for me, it was real palpable. Even as a kid, it just stuck with me so long. You know, when I think about it, too, there's something surreal about it with the fact that it's got such an ordinary looking setting. Like, that's where, like, it's almost like the brightest with the, you know, just a regular office yes. lighting. Yes, yes. You know, it's not really stylized at all outside of, like, maybe that spiral st- staircase thing that he walks down from. But everything else just feels, it, it's like you've transported two characters from a Tim Burton movie into, like, a different like regular comedy type of place, and it's got this weird vibe to it. There, there is something to that scene that that has always like struck me as like it's a true. weird but deliberate like contrast. It to the feels rest of it. it feels weird, surreal because it's a very normal setting. It's just an office, mm-hmm. but then you got the penguin in there, <laughs> yeah. Danny DeVito's penguin, mm-hmm. and he's like, ar, 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 mm-hmm. you know, kind of left and right, and then he's. Unlimited poontang is said, and then <laughs> right. you know he bites a fucking dude's nose off, and he's got blood gut, black bile of us. You know what I mean? Like it's just, yeah. it's a hell of a scene. It's a fucking hell of a scene. Mm-hmm. I I had forgotten about all the rubber duckies and everything <laughs> until I fucking rewatched it. But I remember that. I remember mm-hmm. that fucking scene, dude. Yeah. And of course, all Catwoman shit and all that too. But sure. that that's just really to me the standout penguin scene, dude. Probably. <laughs> It really is. Yeah. It is definitely memorable. It's it's, yeah. very, it's very much the, uh, it stands out to you. I remember that too. I remember uh, as a kid growing up how it was known for being the scary one. You know, this is the dark one, which is, you know, kind of funny considering the, the movies that came after, uh, well, well after under Nolan Snyder and Reeves. But at the time, <laughs> right, it's known to be like the dark one. And I remember, uh, like the nose biting thing really being the thing that stood out because that was that's before you see Penguin's death scene later on in the movie where it's even yeah. like more horrific looking uh, or or Max Shrek's corpse but at that point like that was that was really something that stood out. I got you know what though it's funny you say that because I feel like this one is lighter than eighty nine because you know that whole mm-hmm. like whenever he shocks the guy to death and it's like I'm glad you're dead you know all that <laughs> right. Like, mm-hmm. I think that was super dark, and, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I feel like it's kind of a darker tone. It's a more whimsical Burton tone in the second one. I mean, there yeah. is bile gush mouth and shit, but, uh, I mean, they both have dark parts. But for me, I don't know, maybe it's just some sort of weird nostalgia bias, but 89 is a little bit darker for me. I think Waters, when he was asked about this, uh, he still feels like his version is the darker one because of how much 
I mean, it is threatened, but it didn't actually happen. How um, they were going to basically drown all the firstborn children of Gotham in toxic waste. And he's like, yeah. no other Batman movies tried that. And I'm like, try to be. That's fair, Waters. That's fair. But to be biblical, right? Like Passover, kill the firstborn mm-hmm. son, man. Like it's really, uh, it's dark, dude. You know. But I mean, yeah. you know, good pull, pulling from the pulling from the best. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fucking yeah. the the Bible, dude. Yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, stories that stick with you, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he gave that uh, darker fuel to at least that part. Even though it yes. does kind of descend into uh, robot rocket launching penguins as well, which is hilarious. <laughs> See, and that's why it's lighter too for me. That, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, and the rubber ducky and shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like they had the like duck. the like the, yeah. like eighty nine has like um, was Alicia, you know, her face and all that yeah, too. All like up. yeah, yeah, it, that, all that's pretty pretty dark, man. I think mm-hmm. um, maybe just because I saw that one younger too. I don't know. Maybe yeah yeah. Yeah, I get what you mean, though. There's there's less of a whimsical tone to the first one yes. that makes it, whereas it, it could, depending on who you, who's watching, the whimsical tone to stuff in, in Returns can either make it seem darker or make it seem lighter. You know, some, cause sometimes it might yeah. seem like it's darker because of how light they're trying to make something that's really horrific, you know? Right. And, you know, Burton's, well, we got word from, from Waters, right? Saying that the Burton felt like this was more his film. Or oh, was yeah. it the other guy? We got it from one of our interviewees. I think both of them, really. Yeah, both, yeah. both him and, and Duffield probably said that. I mean, I think that's that, that's kind of no big secret, too, that uh, yeah. he was uh, a lot more like in control or felt more control in this one. And you can see it, too, in just all the aesthetics and the, and the choices that are made here. It's true, man. It's a, it's a reminder to everybody, like... Tim Burton, whenever he was directing 89 Batman, mm-hmm. he did, he's the number one director that year. He didn't get everything he wanted. Yeah. You know, you have to roll with what you can do. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, I find that interesting. It's a, it's a lesson for life, everyone. Yep. That's true. So, let's see. Back to the Batmobile sequence. It's confirmed that Batman did design the Batmobile himself, and he has to re- and he's thinking about uh, how he's going to rethink how it it's it works from now on in terms of how he re- designed it. He's, I guess, regretting some of the design choices now that Penguin's taking it over uh, due to how tough it is, I guess, for him to um, sort of take control, uh, take the control back from it. Uh, and then it says to turn into the Bat Missile where it sort of gets uh, basically broken apart and uh, turned into that thing, which I think was designed by Tim Flattery. From what mm, I remember, nice. Uh, Batman has to put two wires together in order to make that happen, as opposed to flipping the switch a bunch of times, like in the movie. If Tim worked on it, I'm just gonna say it's an S tier, dude. <laughs> I don't even care anymore, dude. Yeah. I just like Tim, man. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> after after that, I was just like, you know what? I should get like one of those. I think Hot Wheels has it, or somebody. Somebody they do sell like the Bat Missile as like oh, a little nice. toy. It's, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Obviously, have the the the. Uh, Batmobile from 89 and Returns, but the Bat Missile I don't have. Yeah. So uh, that'd be that'd be cool to get. Let's see. I mean, Tim worked on it, dude, so there you go. Yeah, that's true. There it is. Uh, there's a nice little character moment, too, in the novelization. That's not in any of the other stuff where uh, Bruce notes to Alfred that uh, Selina, um, there's something about Selina that he likes um, where there's she, quote, unquote, seems to have more facets than Vicky. I think... That's his way of saying that he feels more connected to her because Selena obviously has a more uh, blatant dark side to her compared to Vicky Vale. Um, and he feels like Alfred approves when Alfred doesn't spend time criticizing him for his mistakes and just lets him have his own opinion about his love life. So mm. kind of a nice little dive there into that, that dynamic because we didn't really get a ton of his uh, feelings outwardly being spoken about Selena to Alfred during this movie. So it's kind of nice mm. that they have that. And then, of course, we've got the whole sequence where Alfred tells Bruce that he's he's been invited to Max's Max Scarade Ball. Again, I don't <laughs> think they were blatant about calling that in the movie because that's <laughs> hell to say. Uh, and he asks who he's going as, and Bruce says, you'll never guess since he's going as Bruce Wayne. So My mask. <laughs> yeah. So the novelization says the department store has been patched up since Catwoman's attack, like we talked about with the comic adaptation. Just like in that adaptation, we've got Max saying to deck the halls and shake your booties. <laughs> so uh, that's 
Does it say that in the movie? He doesn't say it in the movie. This is all deleted, where he has a whole speech of them about how um, Gotham City is bouncing back the same way that the store bounced back after being blown up by Catwoman. Oh, so okay, yeah, yeah. That kind of that would have kind of explained, I guess, why the you know the party is at that department store. But like I said before, I always assumed that he had more than one location, considering that this is supposed to be like one of the big businessmen of Gotham. Hmm. Um, it does say that Selena is initially asked out by Chip Shrek to dance, and he's dressed as a Roman soldier at the party in, in the novelization. Whereas in the movie, he's just wearing a um, he's like just wearing a crown type of thing, I think. Uh, and uh, he tries to ask Selena to dance, but she ignores him, of course, because she wants to dance with Bruce. Uh, and Naturally. then just like, yes. Um, like in the comic adaptation, we got a bunch of stuff that's also in the comic book adaptation. So uh, Selena uh, tries to tell Bruce that they have to do something when Penguin arrives, but Bruce is missing because he's gone off to change into Batman. In the movie, it's the opposite. Bruce is the one who's trying to find Selena, but Selena's already disappeared by the time that he recovers from the explosion. And then when uh, Penguin puts Max in the duck, he uh, he lets off a whole bunch of smoke bombs on his way out, which I guess might have been too expensive. Every time I think about the duck, I remember Zach saying, how did he get up through the sewer? Uh, <laughs> I was like... Remember, I, I, I said something like he he had he had, he had to uh, he has the same technology of uh, you know those like uh, springboard things. There's just <laughs> one in the duck too. But he was he was like questioning the uh, the physics of that. I was like, dude, how much are we gonna care about this, bro? <laughs> but it was a funny conversation. It, yeah, it was funny, especially because uh, Zach otherwise usually doesn't seem the type to really question the physics of stuff that is already accepted in a movie like this. You know, we've already got... This is this is a world where Penguin looks like that. You know, he's got rocket <laughs> launching penguins yeah. uh, who obey his commands. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That seems like the least of our problems in terms of how he gets from the duck to the top of the sewer. Plus, it's literally the same thing. It's that platform that... Whatever it is, this... My, my, man, my mechanical, mechanical engineering knowledge is very low. But whatever it is, that spring-loaded thing that you know, springs up the duck itself. Mm-hmm. We see a shot of that. You can just assume there's that same in thing duck. inside yeah. the duck. Yeah. Uh, it's how he goes from the bottom of the sewer through the manhole is what we're talking about. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, um, mm-hmm. it's a long time ago at this point, but uh, it was a funny conversation. Yeah. I think that might've been the concept art uh, episode that we did with Zach. Yeah. So, uh, let's see, we do get to see more of the abductions of the different kids, just like in the comic book adaptation. The knife lady takes one kid, a clown takes a kid who thinks that he's the tooth fairy. And of course, it looks it like there's a Riddler trophy in here. It does kind of look like that, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, what's I think, going on? I think that's mainly, it just looks like a question mark because that woman's cape is covering part of it. I think it's yeah. just really neon lights that are inside. But it does look like we're in, uh, this is something out of Arkham City. Yes, exactly. For a second. <laughs> It's fucking Riddler trophies. <laughs> God go, damn it. Go fuck yourself. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not fucking doing it. Riddler can go free. Riddler can go... Riddle me this. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a riddle. I don't care. <laughs> I think uh, Wally Wing- Winger, when we had him on the show, acknowledged that he was the most hated man in the entire game. <laughs> in the entire like, universe, really. <laughs> his voice performance is incredible. I, I mean, I love it, but... The actual gameplay, you know, they, <laughs> right, they yeah. just, they're trying to pad out the gameplay, give you content. Mm-hmm. And so, and there's a lot of completionists out there. It's just, uh, I probably said that on the Patreon, but I, I'm not a, I'm mm-hmm. not a completionist when I game. I, I kind of yeah. want to get through the main story, maybe a couple other things. And then I'm, I'm generally done. Mm-hmm. I've never a hundred percent of the game in my life. I feel like, well, apparently it's just me. It's just me. to someone else we, you have to in order to actually complete or get through the all the story of arkham knight that's true or just oh, well. watch it on youtube <laughs> 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 that's a way oh, to man. beat the riddler back in the so. day you definitely had to do that shit before the internet before youtube you had to like yeah that's true you gotta get the good ending yeah you gotta do this or you'll never see it find the walkthroughs there used to be, God, this is another conversation, but real quick, the, the mm-hmm. video game secrets used to feel like actual discoveries. 
whenever you discovered mm. them on your own or you talked about it at the, on the playground or whatever. Now mm. there's no secrets. There's nothing truly hidden. There's nothing. There's no true discovery in a video game. So uh, anyway, uh, there goes my uh, retro gaming <laughs> rant. Gotcha. It does, yeah, but yeah, it totally does look like uh, Arkham City here. Yes. Um, let's see. And also an acrobat cartwheels into a room and takes an infant with him as he goes out, which... You know, it might have been Greg Cummins. We brought on Greg Cummins, who played the acrobat who steals the, uh, kidnaps the mayor's baby in the beginning. So maybe they uh, would have put him in that part. Didn't they say somebody the else did the one, like, you know, uh, back handspring or whatever? That was a different guy that we didn't know. It was interview. a different, it was a stuntman who did the actual, uh, like, acrobatics. Greg was, Olympic, was the one who. Olympian who said or they something. Yeah, 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 something yeah, like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, something um, like that. During the abductions, an acrobat tells the children to, quote, shut up and enjoy the choo-choo ride or you'll be sorry, which, you know, we should have had Greg Cummins say when he was on the show. That would have uh, been awesome. But, yeah. Greg, come back. We just need you for this one line. Yeah. Uh, it's also uh, the same when we cut back to the sewer. Max sees the, uh, you know, basically the Penguin's plan about how he's going to lure all the children to drown in the toxic waste. Uh, and uh, there's a lullaby that plays from the umbrella, and Max says or says to himself that he finds the lullaby familiar, which again is another hint about them being brothers, like in the original draft. The novelization doesn't really go much into details other than that, but it is kind of mm. interesting that there are clues there with that, plus Penguin getting the stalking that, um, you know, Shrek seems to remember from his own childhood. Right. So... Uh, the monkey arrives, gives the note to Penguin that the children are not going to be joining them. And just like in a comic book adaptation, Penguin decides not to kill the messenger. And so he decides to shoot one of his own men instead, which is not in the movie. Instead, we got the close, the zoom in close up onto Penguin's fucking mouth. <laughs> Bile filled mouth. <laughs> yes. It's a hell of a transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the confrontation with Selina and Max Shrek, uh, Batman does still take his mask off, but for different reasons. So in the movie, he takes it off in order to try to appeal to uh, Selina uh, not to kill Max Shrek, and then Max shoots him. In the novelization, uh, Max shoots Batman beforehand, and Batman takes off the mask in order to, I guess, use the mask to stop the bleeding. So that's an interesting okay. idea. Okay. Uh, Max shoots at Selina and does manage to shoot off part of the taser taser that she's carrying, but obviously not enough for her to, um, uh, you know, obviously not enough to prevent her from using it on him since that's what she does to kill him at the end. Then we get uh, a whole section or a bit of a scene where Commissioner Gordon sees the lights going, you know, blinking on and off in Gotham. Daniel Waters' favorite uh, deleted scene here after yeah. uh, Selina uses all the electricity to kill Max Shrek. And then we get, and here we go. Here's this lovely image of Penguin with the pile. It's McDonald's favorite image right here. <laughs> they love it. Squeeze, dude. If you squeeze the Penguin toy, the red bile comes out. Bro, I actually words. want that toy now. Like, <laughs> shoot, shootouts it comes with a little bit of goo or something. McFarland God, toys, please make this. Yeah. God, that'd be incredible, dude. Yeah. And then he just keeps talking about needing ice water. Uh, this makeup is so cool, though, dude. I gotta say, is, yeah. man, this these prosthetics is fucking awesome. Honestly, oh, yeah. I think yeah. it's it is great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Batman does. This is one of the the moments where I'm just like, really, okay. Batman points Penguin's umbrella gun at Penguin. Uh, in the novelization as well as in the shooting script, I'm just like, dude, we don't need this. Um, <laughs> Penguin does try to turn around and uh, says that, bat, you know, you wouldn't shoot an endangered bird, would you? You wouldn't shoot me in the back, you know. That's just uh, like uh, you wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? Uh, it is kind of like that, isn't it? 89, yeah. 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 Um, Batman does witness the Penguin pallbearers come out to drag Penguin in back into the sewer. <laughs> I love this narration. This is my favorite part of the narration the entire thing. It says, bat Batman couldn't tell anyone about this. They would never believe him. <laughs> he wasn't even sure if he believed it himself. <laughs> so it's oh, a nice man. little moment and then uh, the novelization does include the deleted scene where the bat signal's on and Gordon asks the mayor if he thinks Batman will ever forgive them and the mayor says that Batman will always be there for them even if he doesn't forgive them he'll be there forever oh wait that's the next one that's the next one yes 
Uh, and then Catwoman, the scene of Catwoman looking at the bat signal is also not in the novelization, just like it's not in the comic book adaptation. Uh, just like in the previous uh, novelization by Craig Shaw Gardner, it ends with the line, welcome to Gotham City. So wow, that's, uh, that's how it ends. There is an abridged audiobook version of this read by Michael Murphy, who played the mayor in the, in the movie. Okay. But uh, again, it is abridged. It doesn't have everything in it. It's not as gutted as the 89 uh, novelization audiobook where they just kind of had their own script that was really truncated. <laughs> but uh, they're doing their own thing over there at Audible. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it was back then. Yeah. Random but, House uh, Audio presents. Yeah. Presents. Uh, we're doing our own shit with Batman 89. <laughs> <laughs> our own Batman. Fuck you. So, yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck your novelization, Craig Shot Gardner. We're improving on it. We're making it way shorter. <laughs> we're doing our own thing. <laughs> so. That is the uh, novelization of Batman Returns. I'm glad we were able to revisit it. I need a copy of the Batman and Robin novelization in order to cover it. I used to have it when I was a kid, and I foolishly gave it away to the you library. Uh, yeah, I know. Seriously. <laughs> so, you know, if I gave it away to the library, if the library still has it, I just then need to go back to my hometown and get it from the it library. It wouldn't be stealing, would it? <laughs> I was the one who gave it to you. So, just yeah, kidding. That could be uh, on its way when I figure out a way to get that back but uh <laughs> there's also ebay dude i mean how expensive can it be <laughs> i $5? already bought the book years ago <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, it's probably 10 bucks you know what it's you know it's christmas soon guys uh, so <laughs> just put Send the bad signal out there you're yeah, gonna get like 20 copies of this book. <laughs> i was just thinking that too <laughs> exactly I was exactly thinking 20 <laughs> like we get 20 copies of the batman oh, robin novelization oh my god well if anybody wants these as re-gifts, here we go. This one could be different. You read them all 20 times, <laughs> one time each. Yeah. It's like they're all the same. Like now, I'm not ready for the episode until I'm done reading all 20 copies of I the gotta same book. I got to know the difference. So uh, this is the year-end episode, so we thought we'd give you a little bit of extra stuff. I do want to sort of give a small recap of LA Comic Con uh, during the time there. I, I, mm. I know that, uh, unfortunately, you were not there. Uh and uh, I missed you there, Andrew. Yeah. Next year, you'll be I joining know. me for this stuff. So uh, there are a few comments as well related to that. So I guess we'll save that till after the uh, the closing part. So I'm just going to say this here, and then we'll go into it. That is superhero stuff you should know. Yay. All right. <clears throat> Big thanks to Dan for gathering the visuals for this. Let's go into some of the comments that were sort of leading into or connected to our Recap of LA Comic Con. So, this is from everybody. Halsey says, Go Ben. Troy Ulysses says, Well deserved and about time. Nervous Creative. Robert Schumann are commenting on stuff. Thank you guys for commenting on uh, the LA Comic Con stuff. Basically, um, it was it was really fun. I was really busy there. Uh, we got to uh, basically meet a whole bunch of people. I got to be on the Geekscape panel which is on the Geekscape uh, podcast. So for those who haven't checked it out, uh, there's an audio version of that on their podcast. It was not filmed uh, camera-wise, but we did get an audio version of that. And nice. so I talked a little bit about my experiences on there. Uh, I talk about this on their episode, so I might as well say it there, but there was a screening of the documentary Doomed, which is about the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie that was never released. And uh, they had a whole bunch of people four people specifically who were involved with that. Uh, so that include uh, Ole Sasson, who was the director, um, Glenn Garland, who was the editor, Joseph Culp, who was the original Doctor Doom for that movie, and uh, Craig Nevius, who was the screenwriter for that uh, for the Fantastic Four film and was not part of the documentary. So um, I got to talk to all of them, and um, they're coming on in January for the interviews. So nice. uh, that's uh, that's going to be awesome. And we haven't really talked much about Fantastic Four at all on this. Uh, but I figured out of all the panels that were going on at L.A. Comic Con, that was the one that was the most connected to our show since it's, you know, it's lost media, really lost superhero media. And with some nostalgia for those who ever got to watch the bootleg version of it, which yes. I did, you know, on YouTube is the first time that um, I had seen it. And you know what? It's not that bad. It's not the greatest thing, but when you take into mind that they only had like a million dollars as a budget and you've got <laughs> Corman behind it, it's it's very faithful to, um, or feels faithful to the, the Fantastic Four movies. And it kind of feels like it would have had the same sort of cult nostalgia following as, you know, like Masters of the Universe, you know? 
Um, so I kind of feel like it would it would be something along that vein. Again, it wouldn't have been like a Batman eighty nine classic type of thing yeah. or Superman seventy eight, but it could have been you know its own its own cult thing. Um, so definitely more deserving than what it got, I think. Uh, also got to meet with Alex of the uh, from our Suicide Squad episode, as well as a whole bunch of other podcasts. What mean flashbacks, a flash rewatch podcast, which I've been on. Night of the Batman, which I surprisingly have not been on yet. We'll figure something out. I'll be on there soon. But um, I take a picture by the Batman statue over in Burbank. And uh, it was really awesome uh, as well to meet him in person, nice. along with his wife, Amanda, who is his co-host on uh, Night of the Batman. Uh, and also shout out to Tyler, who was there. Tyler is a fan who DM'd me that he was also there. And he had me sign uh, a copy of the Metaphoris short story that I wrote for them, Shortcut to Happily Ever After, oh. uh, which was awesome. Nice. You know, I was not expecting that. So it's the first time, I think I told this to him, uh, but it was the first time I, I've uh, basically signed something of my writing to somebody who was not, you know, someone I previously had known, you know, not a friend or a family member. So uh, that was That's awesome. Cool. Thanks, Tyler, for your kind words and for your support and for tracking me down at uh, LA Comic Con. So... Uh, that was pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, next year, uh, it's going to be in October rather rather than December this time. So we'll once again apply oh, and aim to have a that's panel. that's nice. Yeah. So if you do have to go to Seattle again, for whatever reason, in December, it won't interfere because this will be in October uh, this time. So that's kind of a nice, uh, that is coming up a little sooner for next year. Uh, I know Geekscape is going to um, still have a panel there, so we'll still apply, and hopefully we'll get a panel with uh, you and me moderating next year. Fingers God, crossed. I hope so. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Superhero stuff you should know live at LA Comic Con. So yes. Let us know if you want to see that or if you would be there in the comments. Yes. Let's see. Other than that, uh, thanks for the other comments on there. People were commenting on my turtleneck get up because I dressed up as 90s Bruce Wayne. I basically said I was 90s Bruce Wayne. I was in the black turtleneck and the suit jacket, but it could have, technically, I could have been Keaton, Kilmer, or Clooney because they all wore it at some point. <laughs> so, uh, Noir Knight 5729 says the turtleneck, a Wayne classic. Uh, Dos Soda says, How have I not noticed that the suit jacket and turtleneck combination connects Keaton, Kilmer, and Clooney? Nice look, Ben. And Leander <laughs> says, great seeing you on the panel today, forever forward. So Nice. Thanks, guys, for that. But yeah, next year, keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, October, that's great. Yeah, I think so, too. That's great. Uh, let's see, moving on to other comments. Uh, so John Jones, 6764, uh, commented on the Batman 89 comic adaptation, saying, great video. I got both covers recently. Uh, sorry, this is the Batman Returns comic adaptation. I got both covers recently at this used toy store in Pittsburgh. That's cool. Um, that's in reference to the two different covers for the Batman Returns comic adaptation. Um, he says they have so much 89 and Returns merch. Well, shit, let us know where this uh, store is. I might go to Pittsburgh just for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's awesome. This is definitely my favorite place to go. I recently reread the prose novel, novelizations of the original four films, and Returns has these deleted scenes in there as well. Yes as we've been talking about, making me wish they weren't cut from the final film. The thug Catwoman attacks during her debut would have been a nice parallel if they got the same thug from 89, like in the comic adaptation, and just kept going with it, LOL. Like, have him get attacked by Robin in the third film and for him to just flip out and be like, yeah, I'm getting out of this insane city. <laughs> that would have been a funny uh, yeah. carryover. A lot of work for that guy, too. Like, some steady work for him for three movies. <laughs> uh Little scenes of the kids going about their nights before being abducted would have made it even more intense, so I wish it was included. But the movie had so much trouble as it is from, like, McDonald's and shit, I'm sure is what he means. So I can see why it didn't happen. Overall, fun video. I love when you guys do stuff like this. Going to watch the 89 one after the gym tonight, which hopefully he would have done by the time this gets released. So thanks, right. John Jones. Thank you. Uh, and the last two were from Camden. Again, like, year-end episodes, I'd like to add in more than just three in terms of the mm -hmm. comments. Uh, so Camden commented that uh, for the stand-in for Michelle Pfeiffer, who played Catwoman uh, in the final shot of Batman Returns, Camden says, I keep hearing that it was Lisa Marie, but it was likely Trisha Peters. Trisha Peters being the um, Michelle Pfeiffer's double uh, during Batman Returns. So 
could have been. Okay. Could have been. But also considering that that was shot really late in the game, you know, it's also possible that they had to hire someone else if Peters wasn't available. And uh, Camden also does bring up a good point in terms of why the scene was deleted, which I think is also, oh, yeah, I think this is why this was cut. So the scene where Catwoman kills Shrek and the lights blink on and off from the city, Camden says this payoff doesn't make any sense as the dilapidated zoo isn't Gotham's power supply. I think I got to go back to that interview. I think Waters said that was the reason why Tim Burton didn't carry it over because he didn't think it made any sense, which (laughs) is very story driven for Tim Burton. It feels like I feel like a lot of times plot wise, he's he's less concerned with that compared to um, visual stuff like the lights blinking on and off. So I guess something that aspect really bothered him (laughs) enough to for him to not carry that over. He's an ambience guy. He's a tone guy. Mm hmm. You know, that's his thing. An art direction guy. But, yes, somewhat of a story guy to to want that, too. Yeah, that's true. uh, Yeah. But, yeah, thanks for reminding me of that, Camden. Thank you. Cool. All right. Down to the shout-outs. Woo! All right, guys. Thank you again for being part of our podcast this year. What a pleasure it has been. And, uh, yeah, just some of the more recent people that have been added to the Patreon uh, list. So uh, let's go with Put Your Guns On, Michael C, Leom O, Cyber 6, and Mark M most recently. Thank you to our other supporters as well. Thank you guys. 2023, we did it. And uh, we've told you about our friends, and we'd like you to do us a favor. We want you to tell all your friends about us. <laughs> <laughs>